Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session, Net319, adding AWS Backbone to your network. I, we do really hope that you are having a lovely first day here at DreamVent and that you have decided to spend the next uh, hour or so with us. So we are assuming that if you are in the room today, it's because you're either a cloud infrastructure engineer or you're a network engineer breaking to the cloud or you're just curious about networking. So we are going to be catering for all of these personas in this session. Right? So this session is going to be mainly about the backbone. Uh, we are going to talk about the infrastructure, so the, the infrastructure behind the AWS Backbone Network, but we are also going to touch on some of the core principles and tenets that we have used to build this network, and then we are going to move on into some of the overlay services that you as customers use to leverage this infrastructure in the background. Right? We are also going to be talking about some of these common patterns that we see when we talk to customers, um, just putting together different multiple services or tools from the toolbox that is our networking portfolio. So you can build the right pattern, the, right, the best architecture for your business. Right? And then we're going to also have one of our customers sharing uh, their case study and then how they have modernized their network using AWS networking services. Now, this is a level 300 session. So we are expecting that you have some foundational knowledge on networking services, protocols, but also on AWS uh, fundamental concepts, right? So that you are familiar with the cloud, at least. Either way, I'll be touching on, on like refreshing your memory. I know that there's a lot of content, a lot of services out there. So in the first section of the session, I'll be touching on some of those fundamentals just to bring all of the audience to the same level. Cool? So my name is Ernesto Salas. I'm a senior network specialist, and I've been working with AWS for around four years, basically helping customers all th doing all things networking in AWS. And I'm joined today by my friend Corina Motoy. She's a senior solutions architect working for the hybrid cloud team. And we also have Nick Mulenix from Fortif, who's going to be talking about their use case on AWS. Cool. So I wanted to start the session intentionally with this cheeky picture, right? Because it depicts what I spent most of my days talking to customers, and this is it's a summarization of most of my discussions with them, which is they are moving their workloads to AWS. They are currently ongoing um, on workload migrations at the moment, or they are finalizing their migrations, and their data center footprint is starting to look a little bit like this. So it's starting to shrink. Their collocations are starting to shrink as well. And then the data center today looks a little bit like four racks back in the corner that are hosting just hardware devices, like specifically networking hardware devices. And when talking to customers, we have seen how, as the gravity of these workloads move to AWS, also the gravity of the network moves. Right? And we have seen and we have been helping customers like leverage the AWS Backbone Network to interconnect their workloads. But more importantly, now we have seen how customers are using the AWS Backbone Network through some of these services to interconnect also their branch offices. Right? So in the agenda, I'll be covering our infrastructure, so how we have built the largest, uh, most scalable network in the world, um, the tenants behind, behind how we did it, and also why we did it, and how we took some of those tenants and I applied it when building these overlay services. Then I'll do a quick recap where I mentioned that we have multiple services within our portfolio, around 40 plus features and services within the networking and content delivery portfolio, but we do have some common patterns that a lot of customers use today. And I just wanted to quickly go through how we have applied those principles to build these services, why, and then pass it on into, to Corina to talk more about all of these different patterns and how different services come into play. Right? And then at the end, we'll have Nick covering their use case for 40. So let's get started. Uh, a map of the world and all of our global infrastructure um, over it. Right? So, when we talk about the AWS global infrastructure, we have mainly our regions, so AWS regions, and without going too much into detail into what the region is, you can think of it as a geographical location where you will find at least three availability zones or more. And then within an availability zone, you will have one data center or more. So you can think of an availability zone as a cluster of data centers. Right? Then we have local zones, you can think of the local zones as an extension of these regions into heavily populated areas. And we are trying to solve 
basically a networking problem with local zones, which is bringing the application closer to the customers and reducing latency. Um, another way of thinking about local zones is just an availability zone that is closer to customers, right? So in heavily populated areas. Then we have our points of presence, and that would be a combination of edge locations and direct connect locations. So for edge locations, we're talking about CloudFront or CDN, for example, or AWS Global Accelerator. And for Data Connect, it's a service that allows you to extend your private connectivity into AWS. Right? If we zoom in quickly into how, on a very high level, the network topology for a region looks like, this is what you would find. Right? So at least three availability zones. Within each availability zone, you'll have one or more data centers. And in each one of those boxes, you'll, have that you'll find that we have uh, hundreds or thousands of networking devices and hundreds of thousands of links in between them. It's providing you like a highly available um, connectivity and architecture within the region. And we do have, like based on your feedback from previous events, we have been releasing more and more content that, where we do deep dives into the specifics of this architecture. But this is not what we're going to do today. Today we're going to talk about the map. So coming back to the map, I think it looks even more impressive when we overlay the backbone network on top of it. So each one of these lines that are highlighted there, you can think of them as a pair of, of 400 gig connections or fiber cables that we manage and operate globally. So this is all a private network that AWS has built, manages, and operates. Right? But why? So very early on, when we started building our cloud business, we decided that to be able to pass on to you as, as our customers the availability, scalability, performance, and security that you were expecting from us, we had to have full control on our network. Right? So very early on, we took the decision that we wanted to build our own global private network. And that led us to also taking the decision of starting to develop our own custom hardware and custom software. So usually we talk about this, the most common example would be the Nitro platform that we use to power our EC2 services and VPC, for example. But this is also true for the networking hardware and our networking <coughs> devices. Right? Because you can imagine at the beginning when we started working with third party um, traditional vendor providers, we were using our justice platforms, right? That are the typical refrigerator size routers that you have probably seen. And these are amazing pieces of technology. They are amazing at what they do. But we were facing a new challenge, a challenge that no other company had. And these pieces of hardware uh, had a lot of features because they were trying to cater for a lot of customers with a lot of different use cases. We had a very specific use case, and it was very specific to us. So we decided to move away from these complex chassis platforms. And you, just to put it as an example, like putting my operational hat on, think that if one of these chassis would need a reboot, that would be a very large task, right? And at our scale, we could not afford like having reboots at that scale, right? So we could not reboot an entire chassis. So we decided to start venturing into developing and building our own hardware. And these hardware are typically single chip network devices, right? So you can imagine it as a one rack unit uh, IP switch or router that we would use across all of our networking stacks. So the same device could be used as a top of rack switch, we could use it in the backbone, we could use it in, at our edge, and we would have different flavors of the same device. And the flavor would typically be a different speeds. Right? So those tenets are of simplifying. We also applied it and we started creating cells. So this is where the messaging of what you are probably more used to when we talk about EC2 networking, when we talk about VPC or the hyperplane technology behind Trusted Gateway, for example, uh, we talk about cellular architectures. Right? And then what we did is that we put all of these one rack unit switches or routers in a single rack, and that would create a cell. So if we needed to replace a cell that was faulty, we would just remove it, send a new one, and we would make it we were making sure that within that cell, if there was failure, it was not leaking into another cell. Right? So this is true across different stacks in our network, including the backbone. Now, if we had to add special modules 
because we say that whenever a packet leaves our facilities, we encrypt it at the physical layer. So all traffic leaving AWS facilities are encrypted at the physical layer. Then we would add that special model into that device that would be sitting at the edge. Right? And that would lead us to our core tenet. So this is our core tenet or principle that all of our development teams across the infrastructure teams or the infrastructure organization, but also the overlay services or the, the networking services that you consume today as a customer follows, right? So these are the guiding principles, which is simplicity scales. And you, best example for that would be VPC and how at the very beginning when we launched VPC, we really thought that customers were only going to use one VPC. And that was actually hard coded in our systems, right? And if you needed more than one VPC, you had to give us a ring. You have to give us a call, and we started to receive a lot of calls. Because customers started to use VPC to segment their business units, for example, or their applications, so going basically into a multi-VPC environment. But that brought its own challenge, which was like, how can we connect our VPCs together, our applications together? So we decided to launch Amazon VPC pinning. And a pinning within a small environment, you can think it's a way of connecting two VPCs together. So it's a one-to-one, point-to-point -to -point connection. But it's non-transitive, right? So this is one of the say, foundational rules within AWS networking, is if you use VPC pitting, you would have to connect two VPCs together, and you cannot use a, a VPC as transit between um, multiple pinnings, right? So this, this solution and this service works very well, even today. And you can use it if you have 10, 20 VPCs, it's completely fine, it's, it's very manageable. Right? But if you start scaling to the hundreds, thousands of VPCs, then it gets a little bit out of control. So in 2018, we decided to launch Transit Gateway. If you are not familiar with Transit Gateway, you can think of it as a regional router. Now in the background, it doesn't look anything like a router, but logically, you can think of it as a regional router. Right? And Transit Gateway allows you to uh, concentrate all of your connectivity within a region, and it scales to the thousands of VPCs. So we were solving that scaling problem. Also, Transit Gateway allows you through integrations to extend that connectivity to your on-premises, right? So either through an integration with Direct Connect or integrating with side-to-side -side VPNs. And this that you are seeing on the screen right now became one of the most uh, common patterns that we see with customers. So it's a super... Um, Common pattern is a best practice for most of our enterprise customers, and we see this being applied by many of the customers that we talk to today. But as you move away from your data centers, you were not bound to that physical location anymore, the geographical location. And you could start leveraging the multiple AWS regions to bring the application closer to your end customers. So that's what customers are starting to do. And therefore, they started replicating that very same pattern into multiple different regions. So if you have three regions, we go back again to the cross-region pitting connections and to the point-to-point -point connectivity. Now, as this scales, we go back to the same challenge. Right? So how can we manage like 10, 15, 20 regions? Right? It starts to become a really complex network, especially if you don't have dedicated networking personnel to manage this global network within your cloud environment. So last year during Reinforce, we announced AWS Cloud One. It's a service built on the same te technology as Transit Gateway, and it simplifies connectivity at a global scale. We also introduced uh, our new vision for networking services, which is intent-based networking, where you would tell us how you want your network to look like, and we will build it in the background for you, and having backwards compatibility with Transit Gateway. So this combination of what you see in the screen is where the most common pattern using Transit Gateway that I connect side to side VPN uh, integrates with the new version of doing global networking on AWS, which is AWS Cloud One. But these are just some of the services that we have. Right? And as I mentioned a couple of times by now, and probably you are aware as a, as a customer um, building networks on AWS, your environment is going to consist of multiple different networking services coming together. So it's going to be network load balancers. It's going to be side-to-side uh, -side VPNs or client VPNs. It's going to be transit gateway. Maybe you're experimenting with some of the new services like Amazon VPC Lattice. Right? All of these overlaying services 
a way for you to consume our underlying network. So you can think of them as tools right, within a toolbox. But what we want to show you is how you can use multiple different tools that uh, are the, the right tools for the right job. And that's only going to be relevant within your context. So you can have common patterns, but it doesn't mean that you have to take that common pattern and just implement it as is in your environment, right? Also, we have other non-networking services like uh, AWS Local Zones or Amazon Peering, which are a little bit more niche, but are also ways of leveraging the AWS Backbone Network, especially. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Corinne and myself, we spend a lot of time talking to customers. And by talking to customers, we get to see and put together some of these common patterns. So Corinne is going to walk you through all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Hi, everyone. Indeed, we do talk a lot of ca with customers and with partners. So I will introduce you now to Unicorn.ink. Let's have some fun. So Unicorn.ink, it's our customer, a global customer with offices in uh, New York, data center, the headquarter, and also in Mumbai. Again, a headquarter there. Their offices, their on-site locations are connected via their global one which is basically a mix of network technologies like MPLS, internet services, you name it. Um, they are used to connect all their locations, but they are starting to scale. And what they care about is the experience of their end users. Like all of us, like all of us as well, we care about our end customers. We need to provide them the best possible experience. So for that reason, how can they scale while improving latency, while improving the performance of their application, well, moving to the cloud, to the AWS cloud. Because of the proximity, they choose to use the Virginia region, which is closest to, uh, to the New York headquarter, and then the Mumbai region, which is closest to the Mumbai headquarter, of course. And um, once they are in the cloud, they now have a mixed environment, a hybrid environment. The next question is, okay, how can I actually me, unicorn, that think, improve the experience of my end user. So let's have a look how we can do that using the AWS backbone. That's the session about, isn't it? So again, we have this unicorn, that think architecture, mixed architecture, cloud and on-premises location. So to make it more real, let's assume that unicorn, that think, it's a gaming company. And their game, Unicorn Assembly, is so popular that users and gamers all over the world, they want to play it. We have Mexican users, we have Australian users, and everyone wants to play it because it's super popular. You might know some of those games. Um, but they are accessing the game which is deployed in the AWS region via the internet. Mexico to, uh, to North Virginia or Mexico to Mumbai, well, you might imagine there might be some unreliable connections there. So then what can we do? The users, they want to have great uh, experience when accessing the, the game. They want to have fast response when they are trying to play. So let's see how we can improve that user experience or gamers experience, whatever you want to call it. For that, let's look at the AWS Global Network. As Ernesto was saying, it's a private backbone that interconnects all the AWS data centers all around the world and the edge locations with a 400, a fully redundant 400 gigabit Ethernet fiber. This web, sorry, I keep looking there. This web of fiber cables and uh, network devices basically is created to facilitate ultra low latency uh, across the globe between all the AWS locations. That, in connection with the, our 550 plus points of presence, which we call the edge pops, they work together in order to improve and to bring services closer to the end user so that you can have better, uh, better experience, better performance when you are interacting with deployments in the cloud. So let's see how they do that. As you might imagine, there is not one case that one product, one service that fits them all. We all have different, experience, different experiences, so let's go to the first one. And let's say that our players, they just want to access the, gaming, um, the game in the cloud for online, 
for online playing and or in-game purchases, whatever. And they want to do that fast, as, as best as possible. So let's see how they can do that with, while accessing via the internet, but using the AWS Global Accelerator. Basically, AWS Global Accelerator is one of our services available in, in most of our Edge Pops. And what it does is simplifies traffic management, especially if you have a multi-region deployment, and improves the performance of the applications serving, accelerating the delivery of dynamic content. With the AWS Global Accelerator, you take the traffic out of the internet through the 110 points of uh, presence where the Global Accelerator is present, and you move it into the AWS backbone. This way, the traffic then is routed via the AWS Global Network through the regional endpoints that is um, basically gives reducing uh, in-game latency, jitter, and packet loss, all win for both the company and the end user. Um, AWS Global Accelerator reduces, uh, chooses the optimal AWS region, so this is especially important if you have multi-region deployment, based on the geography of the end customers, and that helps us deliver uh, well, help Unicorn that thing deliver the performance with, uh, an, with a better than increased performance of 60%, which is quite a lot if you're comparing with the basic internet, um, internet accessing. Then, since um, the global accelerator operates at the level four of the OSI model, that means it can be used with any TCP UDP application, which is quite a plus. And um, one thing, and that is probably quite important. The Global Accelerator has multiple applications and can, can have multiple applications endpoints in the cloud. Those can be uh, EC2 instances, can be data load balancer, application load balancer, elastic IPs, but all of those are going to be fronted by um, the same Anycast IP address. The moment you are creating the Global Accelerator, uh, basically you are receiving two static IPv4 Anycast addresses. If you choose to have a dual stack global accelerator, you'll get also another two IPv6 static Anycast IP addresses. Those IP addresses are then announced across all the AWS, all the global accelerator pops, and accept those, that incoming traffic coming from the, from the end user via the internet into the AWS global network to the into the edge location, which is the closest to the end users. Once on the AWS backbone, the traffic uh, then travels via the optimal network pack to the endpoints in the, in the region. But um, how about if I'm more interested in improving my user's experience in reducing the time for downloading the content or just feeding the promotional, uh, promotional content? So let's have a look how the Amazon CloudFront comes into play. Amazon CloudFront, probably if you haven't used it, it's our uh, fast, um, it's our service for fast static and um, dynamic content delivery by leveraging the AWS global network. Um, Amazon CloudFront basically employs a global network of edge locations and regional edge caches that caches the content closer to your viewers. But besides uh, static content, also AWS CloudFront serves dynamic content, TCP flows, um, so that is really good to know. Not many people are using for that, and it's really, really good. Um, also, AWS CloudFront do, has, do have persisting connection to the origin. So let's say um, if the request, um, are, if the content is not present in the edge pops, then the connection doesn't have to establish a new TCP uh, a TLS connection to the origin. It just uh, uses the persistent one. Um, additionally, AWS with uh, AWS, uh, with AWS Cloud, Amazon CloudFront with the Amazon Roots 53, together they, uh, they can create some really cool architectures uh, for failover when you're having a multi-region uh, deployment. Basically, high level, how you use the service, you create a CloudFront distribution, and then you configure the origin with a publicly uh, accessible domain name. The origin is where the content is stored, and the CloudFront basically gets content to, to serve the viewers. 
If the content is not available in the hash pops, then we are using the regional hash caches, which are sitting between the hash pops and the, and the origin and has bigger storage. So it can be closer to, to, the, um, to the user, so you don't have to go back to the region via the uh, AWS backbone to, to serve your customers. Um, to summarize, Amazon CloudFront improves the experience of uh, the user by using the AWS backbone for improved origin fetches and dynamic contact acceler acceleration. But how about all is good with AWS um, Global Accelerator and Amazon CloudFront, but how about if your game also provides AR VR experience? Your users need to have single digit milliseconds access to, to, um, to, your, uh, to your game. So let's have a look at the AWS local zones. Um, AWS local zones is an extension of the AWS region in the geographic pro proximity of your users. Um, currently, in this moment, AWS has 33 local zones all around the world deployed in the metropolitan areas. And uh, for, this, for the purpose of this scenario, because we have gamers in Mexico, we have chosen the Querétaro, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, local zones in Mexico. And then uh, for the users in Australia, we have chosen the Perth local zone in Australia. Why? Because they're closer to those users that we, we think are going to access um, our, our AR, VR experience in, in the cloud. So, uh, basically, the local zone is physically connected to a region via the AWS, um, via the AWS backbone. Um, how does it work at the logical level? You enable the local zone in your account, and then you just extend the VPC in from the region to your AWS local zone, and then you can start building in the local zone closer to your to your uh, to your customers. This way, uh, all your customers can benefit again single-digit milliseconds latency um, accessing your your deployment in the local zone. Um, to improve latency, local zone, they have their own connection to, to the internet in, with the ISPs in the metro areas, and they also support uh, Direct Connect. So resources in the local zone can be accessed with really low latency. Uh, also, they have a, IP pool of IP, an IP, uh, a pool of IP addresses, which is totally different than the one in the region. Um, to sum up, AWS local zone basically delivers um, uh, delivers low latency by placing services such as compute, such as storage, and other dedicated services closer to the end user, but is connected via the AWS backbone to the region, having access to all the other AWS services. We have talked about how can we improve the user experience. Let's talk a little bit more about how we can improve you as a company, how you can improve your infrastructure by using the AWS backbone. We're going to discuss a couple of scenarios and we're going to start with the most um, common, I would say, how are you building hybrid architectures and what is the role of the AWS backbone in all this. Again, we have our unicorn that thing. So let's focus now about connecting um, the on-premises site, uh, on sites to the deployments that you have in the, in the region. For the first scenario, because we're going to discuss a couple of scenarios, let's assume that you are a company, Unicorn that thing, which you require very high throughput connection to the AWS regions, to the, to the resources that you have deployed there. Well, the good news is the fact that you, interconnect, you can interconnect directly with AWS Global Network via peering, without using public internet, using our Amazon peering. Um, uh, you can do that in one of our 98 public internet exchange points, but also we do provide also private peering in other selected uh, location. If you want to, to find more about it, about how uh, our interconnect works and how you can interconnect with us, just check the amazon.com profile on peeringdb.com. You will find there all the details. Basically, just as a high level on the Amazon peering, how it works. So in the internet exchange pops, we have all the networks, all, all the networks which are interested in peering there. We have our own routers, which have access to the global network. And basically, 
If we want to interconnect, we are all connected to the same fabric, and via BGP, we are exchanging um, routes, routes between us. What is important to know is with Amazon peering, Amazon selectively um, chooses routes to, to deliver at these locations, depending on the proximity to the region, depending on the service endpoint, different other factors. So it's important to know that even though it's a great way to bypass internet and go straight to your resources in the region using the AWS global network, Amazon Peering is not a service offering. But you want a service offering. <laughs> you want a connection which is reliable, which can provide you an SLA if needed. Then let's have a look at AWS Direct Connect. Basically, AWS Direct Connect offers you the shortest path from on-premises to the resources in the cloud through a dedicated network connection from your site via Direct Connect location and via the AWS Global Backbone. Um, the AWS Direct Connect locations, if you, are, if you are using AWS Direct Connect today, you probably know they are third party uh, co-location facilities where via cross-connect between the AWS home device and the partner or customer uh, device, um, the customer get, uh, gets access to all the, the AWS backbone so they can route to the, to the region wherever they have the resources deployed. As a customer, basically you can choose to have your own dedicated connection, um, and that can get you uh, dedicated links of up to 100 gigabit per second, or you can have a connection from one of the partners which we call hosted connection, and that can give you connection up to 10 gigs. With AWS Direct Connect, we also have the concept of Direct Connect Gateway, which is a globally available resource. And you can use the AWS Direct Connect Gateway to connect AWS Direct Connect um, connections over, um, to connect your own premises over the Direct Connect connection to the resources in the cloud um, using a private VIF or a transit VIF or you can have also public VIF on the Direct Connect connection, which gives you access to the public endpoints. Please bear in mind, Direct Connect Gateway doesn't work with public VIFs, only with private and transit VIF, just to be, to be clear on that. So now, we have talked about how you can go into the AWS Global Network and get to your resources in the cloud from the on-premises. Then how about if you have a multi-region deployment, which I'm sure most of you probably have today, but you have a low number of VPCs. Well, for that case, you would probably have a private VIF on your Direct Connect connection, which goes to the Direct Connect gateway, <laughs> and then you have the virtual private gateway from your VPCs being associated with the Direct Connect uh, gateway. And the question is, okay, how am I connecting the VPCs between them in different regions? And for that, basically you have the cross-region VPC peering, which um, when you establish that peering connection between your VPCs from different regions, you ensure that the traffic remains in the private IP space and always stays in the AWS backbone. So using cross-region VPC peering, the traffic always stays on the global AWS backbone, so that is secured and um, we manage it. Um, what is important to know, and also Ernesto mentioned, is the fact that with um, cross-region VPC peering, the is not transitive. So, for example, in this case, if you don't have a connection from Mumbai to, to the Mumbai region via the Direct Connect, and you want to go from New York to the to the Mumbai region to the VPCs in the Mumbai region, you won't be able to that, to do that natively. Of course, there are workarounds. We all know that. But just keep in mind that uh, cross-region VPC peering is not transitive. So a better way to do it is also suitable for a, for a multi, for a, um, for, a low, uh, for a more VPCs, for more VPC deployment, sorry. Um, it's basically, if you're doing that, you're having a transit gateway because you need to connect all your VPCs together. 
So with a transit gateway, you would probably have on your direct connect a transit VIF that is being um, attached to the direct connect gateway. And then the transit gateway is being associated with that direct connect gateway. And in order to have your VPCs communicate to each other, you can have inter-region transit gateway peering. Um, as with uh, cross-region um, VPC peering, also with inter-region transit gateway peering, the traffic stays on the global AWS backbone. So from one region on to the other stays in the AWS global backbone. From the management point of view, with the, with the inter-region peering, the root table entries that you'll have to configure in on transit gateway will have to be inserted manually. Just a piece of advice, when you are configuring your transit gateways in different regions, just make sure they have different ISNs. In the future, maybe we're going to discuss about having the rules being dynamically propagated, but once you are configuring a transit gateway and you're choosing an SN, you can't update it afterwards. So just make sure you have different SNs. Um, we've talked about the hybrid architectures. Now, a very cool use case for the AWS Global Backbone is how you connect the on-premises site totally bypassing the AWS region. And for that, we have our unicorn that thing, and we want to connect New York with Mumbai and to create that reliable transit network connectivity. And for that, we're going to use AWS Direct Connect Site Link which basically connects on-premises sites bypassing the region. That means you don't have to have anything in the region. Nothing at all. <laughs> all you have to have is basically you have to use Direct Connect and you will have to create uh, VIFs on the Direct Connect. And I say VIF because you can have private VIFs or transit VIF. And when you create them, you just have a tick box and you say, okay, I want to enable site link on that particular VIF. Very easy and very nice. We can even add a third site to make it more interested. interesting. And actually, we can add up to 30 interfaces and uh, attach them to the Direct Connect Gateway. That means you can have up to 30 different on-premises sites, all of them using um, Direct Connect, and you can, you can use SiteLink for that. <clears throat> Basically, once all those VIFs are attached to the same that is important to the same Direct Connect Gateway, you start sending data between them. Your data follows the shortest path between the AWS Direct Connect locations to its destination using the AWS Global Backbone. You can have private VIF and transit VIF. Again, public VIF doesn't work with the Direct Connect Gateway. And again, connectivity remains in, in the AWS Global Network. So with Silink, Direct Connect Gateway, basically learns BGP IPv4, IPv6, so both are supported, uh, from your routers over the Silink enabled VIFs, runs BGP uh, best path algorithms, updates um, attributes such as like uh, next hop or um, uh, IS prepand, and then advertises this BGP prefixes to the rest of your Silink enabled VIFs. After receiving these advertisements from the Direct Connect Gateway, your routers update then is routed and forwards the traffic between the side link enabled uh, locations using the shortest path between AWS Direct Connect locations over the AWS backbone. What is important to know is the fact that you can use this functionality and transform the AWS global backbone into your primary backbone or just a backup to your, to your current existing backbone. And another use case which is quite, uh, quite common with Silink is the fact if you are expanding, it's just, uh, it's just easy to add new locations as the business grows. And that takes us to our last scenario, building your SD1 hub on AWS. Uh, again, we have Unicorn that thing, and Unicorn that thing is running SD1 on the on-premises. I don't know how many of you are doing that, but we do have customers. And what they are asking us, okay, is how can I integrate whatever SD1 I'm running on the on-premises with the AWS cloud? Because now I have deploy deployment in, in the AWS cloud. So what we have seen our customers doing is basically they deploy their SD1 appliances 
in the AWS in a VPC of its own. Let's call it SD1 Appliances VPC. And then they connect their own premises via Direct Connect, private VIF, AWS Global Backbone <laughs> using Direct Connect Gateway and then the virtual private gateway to that VPC. We have a transit gateway. We go for a scenario where we do have multiple VPCs in the cloud. That transit gateway already has all the workloads VPCs attached to it. So we attach this SD1 VPC appliances to the transit gateway. We extend the overlay from the on-premises to, to the AWS um, um, SD1 appliances VPC. Let's call it like that. But we then need to to integrate the SD1 appliances VPC with the transit gateway because there is where we have all our workloads in the VPCs attached to it. So we are, for that, we are using Transit Gateway Connect, which is our native way of integrating SD1 appliances into the AWS Transit Gateway by running a GRE tunnel on top of the, of the VPC attachment to the Transit Gateway. Doing this, basically, you have end-to-end -end management of your global network using the current orchestration platform of your SD1 partner for the on-premises, which is a major plus. Um, Direct Connect is one way on, um, to use it as a transport mechanism for your SD1, but again, you can use also internet to get to your SD1 appliances VPC in the, um, in the cloud. When you're having multiple slides, um, I just want to call out with SciLink, you can actually extend your SD1 from one side to another, just enabling uh, SciLink on your virtual private interface or transit virtual interfaces. The question comes, how about if I have multiple regions? I have multiple regions, multiple on site. Um, how I manage my SD1, how I manage this integration? And more important, how I keep the same segmentation, traffic segmentation that I have on premises in the cloud, regardless of, um, of the destination or the source of the traffic. For the scope of this um, scenario, let's use, uh, we have on premises two, two routing domains. We have production and dev test. And I want to keep those in all the regions that I'm using. Okay, we have two regions here, but maybe you use three regions, four regions, 10 regions. But we want to keep the same traffic segmentation. With SD1, um, basically, you can create different transit gateway connects for each type of, um, of uh, segments that you have on the on-premises, extend them to the transit gateway in the region. In the transit gateway, as you know, we can have multiple domains, but then comes the question, okay, and then with the transit gateway peering, can I extend my, um, my different domains across the regions? Well, not quite. And the reason for that is because the traffic that goes via the, um, via the transit gateway into region peering is um, used by all the traffic. We don't keep different segmentation. So then how can you have that global network across on premises, across, um, across different regions, and maintain the traffic segmentation, which is important for me, because let's be serious, we all care about what is dev, what is test, and uh, what is production, especially. For that, let's look at AWS Cloud One. Basically, AWS Cloud One is our service, as also Ernesto mentioned, which basically makes it easier to, to manage, monitor, uh, monitor a unified network. A unified network which has on-premises and also, um, also multi-region deployments. To do that, we're going to start our migration from our multi-region transit gateway-based architecture directly to a big band Cloud One architecture, just for the interest of time. So we're going to start with building the global network, which is um, just, it contains all the network elements in your global network. Then you are building the core network, which is part of your global network, but are, is containing only the elements which are managed by AWS. And the third most important thing is basically the core network policy, which makes it be really easy to manage uh, your network with AWS Cloud One. Uh, the core network policy is using, um, it's, um, using JSON format, and you declare there how you want your segments to be, what attachments to have, how do you want routing to work, really. And we'll see how this translates to our architecture. Um, 
So in the core network policy, uh, we define the regions that we want to have. In our case, we have Virginia and, um, and Mumbai. And in that moment, uh, Cloud1 uh, builds those core network edge routers. Uh, they are quite similar with transit gateways, so we're going to build each one in, um, in their own region, and then the attachments will be basically attached to the core network edge routers. After that, we are starting to, to build our segments. Again, we had our production and our dev, and let's have an hybrid segment as well, the connection with the on-premises. Segments are dedicated routing domains, uh, VRFs for... Um, a better term, if you want to call it like that. And we can define those segments in the routing policy as well. It's all done in the routing policy, really easy. In the interest of time, again, I'll go straight to a big bang uh, migration directly to, to Cloud1. So our VPCs, which initially were attached to the transit gateway, we are now going to attach them to the Cloud1 segments. Uh, it, Cloud1 supports native VPC attachments. And basically, the mapping of VPCs to the segments is specifying the core network policy. For example, here, all uh, in this core network policy, all attachments with the tag prod will be mapped to the segment prod. Besides VPC attachments, Cloud1 also natively supports VPC connect attachments. And that allows you to connect SD1 appliances to your core network edge, to your Cloud1. And what is really cool is a couple of weeks ago, we have announced also um, Tunnelus, so Tunnelus protocol. So besides GRE, we are, we are now supported Tunnelus. And what is cool about that is the fact that it's used for high performance. So with GRE or IPsec protocols, you know, there are some packets overhead, which with the Tunnelus protocol, we don't. So for that reason, if you're using that, you can get up to 100 gigabits per second attachments, which is quite, uh, quite interesting if you do require that high throughput. Um, so we, <laughs> we have attached the VPCs, we have attached our SD1 uh, VPC. Uh, probably you have also some VPNs. You can attach them. Cloud1 supports native VPC, VPN attachments. And in case you need to attach direct connect to your Cloud1, um, as of today, we don't support native attachments, so you will have to have your direct connect attached to the transit gateway, and then the transit gateway paired with, um, with a core network in, in that particular region. And that takes us to a discussion. So when you're going to build your architecture, think about, okay, do I really need a big bang approach, moving all your VPCs to cloud one, or do I need um, a federation approach where I can federate the transit gateway with the cloud one and then coexisting together. Because again, if you need uh, direct connect, you will need to have transit gateway as well. We do have some really cool blog posts about this. So if you're thinking about this, about using cloud one, just think which one is the best strategy for yourself. Um, so our initial uh, architecture is now migrated to, to the cloud one. That means you're going to use a network manager to manage it single pane of glass, you can use the core network policy to have built-in automation. It's ideal for multi-region deployments, for multiple on-premises sites. So just be free and tr give it a try. Um, we went through a lot in the last uh, 30 minutes. Um, hopefully all useful scenario, or at least for each of you, at least one useful scenario that you can implement or at least made you think. So now, for a real-life example of Unicorn Dating, I'm going to hand over to Nick, and he will tell us how uh, Fortif have used AWS Cloud1 and AWS Global Network to, to build their global uh, network. Thank you so much, Karina. So it's really great to be here. I'm really excited. Uh, my name is Nick Molinex. Uh, I'm with Fortif, and um, this is our story about how we migrated our physical data center interconnectivity into AWS. Um, and what, how this might be relevant to you, uh, perhaps you have a, a physical data center connectivity presence today, perhaps you have a large um, operational footprint, you might be operating out of multiple regions, maybe even multiple continents. Or, uh, you know, so with Fortive, we have uh, that same scenario. And if you take a look at our, our diagram here, um, this beautiful diagram that I've, that I've architected here, this is kind of what our scenario was uh, you know, a couple years ago. 
Uh, we, we have a, uh, a little bit of background about Ford. Of, we are a, a technological conglomerate. We have manufacturing. We have lab presence, uh, the whole nine yards, right? So a lot of our spoke connectivity for our spoke sites, uh, there might be a lot of different use cases going on there. Uh, but effectively, we provide centralized infrastructure services, and we've got to allow all of our spoke sites, no matter where they are, to be able to communicate to the, the central fort of WAN, so to speak. Um, so we had a lot of legacy technologies, and these physical data centers, you've got to pay somebody to, to you know, lay hands on your tools. You have to pay for these physical circuits. It's, it's difficult to manage, and it doesn't scale very well. So uh, in operational sense, we had a lot of issues with uh, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous routing is probably the, most, the best example. Um, but you know, it's very difficult to make changes at scale to a network like this, right? So um, in, in looking at this and, and partnering with AWS, Fortiv has a great uh, partnership with AWS and has for some time. And we're leveraging a lot of the other pieces of the AWS fabric. So it made sense for us to start to look into how can we move some of the network functionality into AWS. And at first, we had kind of this construct where we were trying to take that same regional connectivity that we had, uh, where Fortiv had three different physical data centers that were on-prem in Amsterdam, in Seattle, and in Ashburn. And so taking that same kind of footprint and trying to push it up into AWS, we, we came up with, with this regional flow. And this is very heavily abstracted, of course, right? So, um, but, but the important point here is that all of the traffic is going to be flowing up towards a regional core of some kind. That regional core is going to handle all of the, the peering, the routing relationships, and, and things of that nature. So whether I'm a DMVPN spoke, maybe I'm in some kind of direct connect, I'm an SDM provider, SD-WAN spoke, what have you. Eventually, when my connectivity, when my routes enter into the region, they're going to home run to our, our beautiful transit gateway, be a, a series of transit gateway attachments. And eventually, we're going to end up at that regional backbone, right? So this, this worked really, really well until it came time to go multi-region, right? And so that's where we found ourselves is how do we, how do we kind of make this scale a little bit better and, and make this so that we can operate out of multiple regions and, and exchange exchange routes. So transit gateway peering doesn't, doesn't really uh, scale that well for us. The, the big missing piece that was really, really important for us at Fortiv was, was AWS CloudWAN. And I can actually still remember reading about AWS CloudWAN. I wasn't at AWS reInvent in 2021, but I believe it was announced at AWS reInvent in 2021. And I, I might not get the date right, but I know it was late June 2022 when, this, when it hit the market. And we were ready at Fortiv to implement that very quickly. Um, so what that kind of looked like for us is this, right? So we have our three regions. We, we created a Cloud WAN uh, core network edge attachment in each of those three regions. And the magic here, the secret sauce, is that now my backbone routing firewalling devices, what you'd like to call them, they're able to talk to one, each other, one another directly, right? So I can, I can create my BGP peering relationships. And now I can exchange my routes dynamically. So this is a fully dynamic solution. If I add another spoke site, if I subtract a spoke site, if we add a new direct connect, what have you, um, that at a high level regionally, it's dynamically allocating. It's, 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 it's pretty much automatic, right? Um, so this is really, uh, and again, very, very high level overview of this. But what this did for us is effectively reduced our MTTR for our entire network stack for resolution by 35%. That's how much uh, ticketing, incident ticketing, ticketing, uh, re request ticketing, and things of that nature that we're actually able to take completely out of our environment um, by going to this system here. And uh, you know, another thing that I'd like to point out is that this is an extremely performance solution. So AWS Cloud WAN, um, there's a couple different use cases that I can point out to you that uh, I was really amazed by the, the performance. Uh, the first one I'll tell you about is we have three regions here, right? But we all have contingents of workforces in a lot of different areas. Uh, for ours, we have a lot, a, a, a very large contingent workforce in India. Uh, we have a, a very big manufacturing footprint in Australia, right? So with this solution here, I can take and create a new region, uh, let's say in like AP South or uh, for Mumbai or something like that. And I can deploy this same type of topology within hours. So I can create the, the I can roll out the virtual image, the EC2 image for the router. I can create the, the peering relationships. 
And I've done this in practice. I can tell you a colleague of mine, a former colleague of mine that's now at AWS, Eric Brooks, uh, if you go and ask him, he'd say the same thing. We can both remember running this test where we spun up this infrastructure and we expected to maybe see some, some performance impact. We're looking at maybe an MPLS connectivity from Australia directly to another site. And we're thinking, well, maybe we're gonna take some additional latency. This actually outperformed our MPLS. And it felt like magic because it's, well, that you expected there's additional transit path, you know, all this additional technology involved. It's gonna be a little slower, but let's see if we can make this work. No, it actually worked better. And we had to go back and check our work. Did we, are we missing something here, right? So that was really, really exciting. And so, you know, in terms of scale, for me, this makes me sleep a lot better at night because now I can extend my regional availability for all of my core network services as close to our user base as we possibly can. So we started with three. You know, I think we'll probably have five within the next year. Um, and one thing I do know about AWS is they're adding things all the time, probably added something while we're up here talking. Right, so I assume there will be more regions all the time for AWS CloudWAN as well. And, and it's fantastic. You know, it's, it's really very helpful for someone in my, in my position uh, to, make, to make things a little bit easier. Right? So mo more performant um, for sure. And the best thing for me is operationally, how much did it cost? Well, it actually saved us Boku bucks. Uh, we nearly eliminated uh, two thirds of our spending. So operational. Uh, operational spending went, went down by 66%. So it really isn't very often that somebody in my position gets to, you know, network, we're usually cost centers, right? We usually, we cost the company money. And if we want to put a new technology in, that usually costs the company money as well. So to be able to put something in that worked better, that was easier to support, that was more flexible, more scalable, more adaptable, and it was cheaper for my company, that was fantastic, right? So, you know, this is, you know, sum things up, and I'm going to hand this back over to Ernesto. I know this is very, very high level, but you know, keep in mind that this is actually, this is really, in my opinion, the future. You know, it's, it's very, very flexible, and, and uh, I really look forward to, to seeing more companies go through the same transformational journey. So thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, 100%, a lot of claps for Nick. Honestly, I love his energy, and we had great fun working with Nick, Nick and Fortif building or modernizing their global network. So who better than Nick to come and, and tell the story, right? And similar to Fortif, we have multiple other customers like going through the same transformation, different levels of maturity, and different set of combination of services. So we try to cover some of the most popular ones. That's what Corina um, covered today through the, these use cases. Um, I wanted to show you also how we do things in the background, so that the bits that you don't get to see uh, of course, this, this was a level 300 session, but I will invite you to go and check some of the other 400 plus sessions where we really go deep into how we have built actually our network infrastructure from the data center up to the backbone. All right. So just as a last call out, as Nick and Corinne mentioned, we're constantly releasing new features, new services uh, to better improve our offering and allowing you to build these global networks on AWS. As Corinna mentioned, we have recently launched what we call Tunnelless Connect. It's a little bit difficult to pronounce, um, which basically removed the need of the GRE tunnels to extend your SD1 connectivity into uh, Cloud One, right? And facilitating the creation of those global networks. If you have a preferred SD1 provider, then you can easily connect to Cloud One and remove the burden of having an extra overlay with GRE. Also, we have more case studies from other customers talking about the performance improvement they have seen when migrating, for example, to Sidelink. We have Motional and talking about the performance they, they managed to measure themselves as well as the cost savings around that. And as Nick mentioned, it's very true, like networking is usually a cost center. So when we talk about networking and, and how we can implement new solutions, how to prioritize that within your company, we are usually looking at, okay, how can we reduce costs when, when talking to our bosses, right? So I'll leave you with those QRs. Uh, you can download the presentation uh, at the end and use the QR codes to give it a read. But I'll also invite you, we have a bunch of our network specialists presenting uh, during event across the week. 
they have put a lot of work into creating not only breakout sessions like this one, where we're just covering a little bit more the theory, but also like hands-on workshops that are like super cool. So I will invite you to come and check them out. They are all amazing. I've tried the workshops myself. If you want to get a taste of these, some of these new networking services that are actually pushing the boundaries of what traditional networking is, like Amazon VPC Lattice or Cloud One, and they are changing completely the consumption model as a network engineer, how you interact with your network, I will really recommend to get hands on and get your hands dirty um, on these hands on workshops. So, as usual, thanks, thanks a million for spending this hour with us. We uh, in AWS uh, value feedback. You know, as a customer, we take 90% of our work of our roadmap when building new services and features comes from feedback from customers. So the time that I spend talking to customers, I spend talking to the service team and adding your feedback to them. But in the same way, we do it when creating new content and when we are planning the sessions for the next events. Right? So it'll take you a couple of minutes, but if you can leave our feedback, that would help us a lot understand what type of content would you like to see and we will build it for the next events. Thank you. <laughs>